Most people in the music business are just too old. That's always been a bit of a problem, you know. Four years old, I decided I was going to be a pop star, sort of thing. Quite seriously? Yeah. Well, I told Santa Claus I wanted an amplifier and an electric guitar, so that's quite serious. Inspired by what? Seeing somebody on the TV? Yeah, but at that time, my sisters, who are much older than me, were really into Herman's Hermits and The Move and The Beatles and The Stones. So I was surrounded by all these glamorous pop stars. Met in the summer, I would walk to the fall And brothers we talked to was tongues Despite what they say Wasn't you who hit the truth Face the drummer that fell from the wall But nothing was left where they hung So sweets and bits What we found, so drink them Well, at least Kilbride was a kind of new town. If you've ever, ever seen the film uh, Gregory's Girl, then you'll get an idea of what it looks like. I've never been to Milton Keynes, but I'm told it's the same idea. Was it quite a bleak place? Well, I suppose if you're used to living in, a, you know, Camden or something, it, it would look like that. But it's pretty good. I mean, it's better than growing up in a slum. You do have, you know, nice grass bits, which they design for you and everything. A nice place for children and animals. You can't imagine it being a sort of creative community or anything, though. I mean, were you a sort of little flower growing up amongst the concrete or something? Well, not exactly a little flower. Uh, I suppose the first time I started hanging out with a lot of people who were like-minded was during the punk revolution of 1977, 78 and all that. What did you do in the punk revolution, Daddy? Hung around outside the record shop and browsed through their indie singles. And who were the people that you were bumping into hanging around outside the record shop? Um, well, funnily enough, we never saw the Jesus and Mary chain very much, although they grew up in the same, the same town. Um, there were a few bands around there. The New Town Scum being the most famous.
play songs during the punk thing and got together with uh, some people in Glasgow. And hey, you must have been awfully young during punk. How old were you then? About 13. But, and I was already, already playing the guitar by then and sort of starting to write songs and all that. But they weren't very good. We ended up doing Clash covers most of the time. What were your songs like then? Apart from not oh, being very Probably good. a bit like Screwdriver or something in retrospect. <laughs> God, you've come a long way, haven't you? Um, I don't suppose anybody watching this will actually remember Screwdriver. Really? Blackpool's finest. <laughs> <laughs> so, Clash covers, and then what? Well, I suppose then, when we got into punk music and sort of followed it from there, it sort of opened up a bit. And we became much more broad-minded and started to listen to alternative TV and, you know, before long we were into 60s stuff. Because it was an album sleeve of... Uh, the singer from Alternative TV, Mark Perry, surrounded by his favourite records, and it was all Zappa and Love and things like that. So he went backwards, I suppose, and found some nice melodies and some good 60s ideas and started to use that. Went on to Postcard Records and put out our indie singles there. I couldn't believe the first idea and the first time that someone actually sent a letter to say they had a record and it was from America or something. I just thought, I can't believe this. You write a song in your bedroom and it goes off to someone else's bedroom and they write back to you. A great means of communication, I think. Oblivious. Um, I consciously wrote it, <clears throat> pardon me, as a pop song. And um, at the time, I suppose a lot of people were listening to more sort of esoteric music. But I thought it was, you know, prime top of the pop's material. I thought it was very catchy. And it turned out to be quite a hit. Mark Knopfler, either you chose him or you had him chosen for you as a producer, which was it? Mm. Well, I chose Mark Knopfler as producer. Why? Apart from the fact that it was quite contrary, I suppose, for a Scottish indie band to have someone who was a kind of well-respected, if you like, musical figure. I just thought that some of the music he'd done was great. When he worked on Bill for Scythe films and everything, it was fantastic. And I had a nine-minute song that I wanted to record. I don't think anyone could have recorded that better than him. I think he had lots of good ideas for it. You, say, you sound quite defensive when you say that. Did you get a lot of stick about your choice? Well, he wasn't, you know, the favourites at Postcard Records or anything, you know. I mean, no one would have thought of Dire Straits, but that's not really 
what interested me. I wanted someone good at the controls, someone who was a good overseer and someone who had good ideas. How did you find it working with him? He was good, very professional, didn't like to waste time. I'm quite ambitious in a way, quite selfish in that the band is always changing, always, you know, I'm always like getting different musicians in and trying to improve on things. So there must be a degree of ambition there. Yeah. Not that kind of blind ambition that tends to permeate the music business though, where it's just like, got to get to the top, got to get to the top. Well, when the album night came out, we went off on quite a big tour, sort of tour around Europe and went to America and Japan and all that. And uh, I hadn't really been writing much on the road, so I'd been pretty busy. You know, when you finished a gig, you know, I don't want to come back to my hotel and sort of start playing again, you know, I'm sure. Lots of people like to do that, I can't be bothered. Um, the gig's enough for me. And when we came back, um, I started to write songs that were a bit different from what I'd been doing. I suppose at that time I'd started to listen to some of those more sort of mellow groove American records, you know. Like what? Like Sugar Free by Juicy and Sexual Healing by Marvin Gaye. And after that, Anita Baker. And she was my big favourite for a long time. And I wanted to make a record something like that. But obviously, I can't turn into Anita Baker overnight, so it was a bit of a mixture of all these different things. And uh, with the lineup I was using at the time, it wasn't really working out that way, so I decided to get some New York producers and go and, go and work there. And I spent about four months there in the summer.
Well, I called the album Love because it was the most honest thing I could call it, really. I decided to find a title for it by looking through the lyrics. And in every song, love comes up all the time. And I thought about it more. I thought, well, that's too blatant, you know. That's kind of like calling a new uh, model of automobile the car. You know, because most pop songs are about love. But then I realised that all the best pop songs are about love. That love is the best thing that we do and that it, you know, it's, it's at the bottom of all the best things. Christianity, left-wing politics, these are all caring things and sharing things. Uh, right-wing thought is based on self-love, self-interest, greed. And uh, love is a great thing. Maybe that sounds a bit 60s, but I think it's, it's what the world needs now. I'd like to teach the world to sing. <laughs> Oh, I worked very hard on this LP. You ask anyone, I was a real pro. <laughs> Did you have working on it with you then? I mean, you weren't using the old band. No. So you were just playing on it. Completely different people. We had um, Tommy LaPuma and Russ Teitelman producing some stuff. David Frank from the system. Marcus Miller, the bass player, who's done just about everything. Luther Vandross and um, some singers who'd worked on the last Bowie LP. Just lots of people who just work all the time. Yeah. Now, what's it like working in those circumstances as opposed to like recording with a group who, are, to some extent or another, must be your, your friends and you know you know each other and stuff like that? I mean, are they just sort of hired hands, like mercenaries, come in <clears> and do their bit? Well, you could you could say that session musicians are mercenaries. But I don't look at it that way. I just rather spend an hour getting a drum track down than two days. And that, that suits me. And most of these people are good musicians. They do it a lot. And as long as you stay there and, you know, expound your ideas all the time and, you know, definitely take control and get try to get what you want, then that's fair enough. Did it make you feel nervous at all? In, in which way? I'm sorry. Well, I don't know. All these guys who played with everybody from Luther Vandross to whoever, you know, and there's you, this wee Scottish boy going in there and telling them what to do and what have you. I mean, I'm sure you're very confident about your own abilities, but I could understand it if you felt a bit like, you know, I'm in I charge think, of all this. I think when you, when you have people who are used to playing lots of different records, their attitude is very flexible. And I genuinely have to be a pretty nice person, otherwise people won't hire you twice. So I think... Um, I probably got about the best out of these people. It's called love And every cruelty will cloud it And if life is like true love can never allow it It's a lie that we have ceased to believe We said goodbye but it won't take its leave Why should it take the tears of a woman To see how men are Well, How Men are is just a very simple song about how men screw women over and how it hurts men and women. And uh, the other line is, why should it take the tears of a woman to see how men are? Which could be from an old country and western song or something. But there are no hidden meanings or anything like that. And uh, we made a video for it recently and decided to show how women are. Because I'm so sick of all these videos, you see. Which I don't know so much now, but for a long time there, there's lots of videos with sort of dodgy looking 40 year old guys playing the piano. And all of a sudden it flashes over to this woman who'd have nothing to do with them. Like, some 18-year-old Jerry Hall type and sort of getting out of a limousine and adjusting her suspenders. So I wanted to show like how women were. So we got a lot of like our mates in and um, people from the high street, women from the chip shop, um, motorcyclists, a lot. Really went for the idea of showing women in a video, in a pop video format the way they are, which is all different colours and shapes and sizes and ages and, and basically try to show that. And you find that they've got much more character in their faces and in their actions. 
on camera and your models. What you don't know, I will get you. It will hurt you and desert you. So you better see that it's a damage ever done by the priest. And some will take a turn. I suppose I look on songwriting as something that's, that's quite natural, comes quite naturally to me. And um, when I'm working on a song, I'm quite excited. It's my little project and everything I want it to be right. And uh, all I want to do at the moment really is to tour and play. But I haven't been doing much of that. We went to America for a month and that was great. You know, that's the main thing really. If you can play the guitar and sing and cut it every night, that's fine. You know, until you can do that, I don't think there's much point in going into the studio with it. Somewhere in a city where the air is still A baby being born to the overkill well, Who cares what people say We walk down love's motorway A vision of love Wearing boxing gloves And singing hearts and flowers But somewhere Oh